Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. A young and striking blonde entered the cafe. She headed to her favorite table near the window, where her friend was already waiting for her. The girls met at this place every Tuesday at 2 o'clock. They had lunch and shared their achievements with each other. Their victories were counted by how many men they managed to charm so that they wanted to spend money on them during the past week. As usual, the waiter, who already knew these girls well, asked, Yes, I'll have my favorite pasta and champagne. Bring a whole bottle. Indiana declared solemnly, the same blonde who had just received several lascivious looks from the men in the cafe. I guess we're celebrating something important today since we'll be drinking right in the middle of the week, Juliana smiled and winked at her friend. Indiana smiled and showed the ring on her finger. Her friend immediately squealed with joy. Bring the most expensive champagne. Juliana told the waiter. Such an occasion deserves a grand celebration. The waiter congratulated the girl and left the friends alone. Is that your roke? Okay? Juliana asked with interest. He finally proposed. I thought it would never happen, Indiana sighed. She had been dating a wealthy man for two years. He was a widower. It was not easy for the girl to curry his favor. Moreover, the millionaire also had a daughter. Indiana and Roque's daughter were almost the same age. The lover was only five years older, so the daughter treated Indiana with caution. In the end, Indiana managed to achieve everything, and the rich man proposed to her. It was not easy for Roque to make this decision. The man thought that after his wife's death, he would never marry again, but then Indiana appeared. Initially, she played the role of a mistress. Roque occasionally met with her, then wanted to stop communication with his lover altogether, but Indiana didn't want to let go of the wealthy man so easily. She texted him herself, sent photos, and asked for meetings. Roque kept his mistress a secret from his daughter. Victoria knew that her father had long ceased mourning her mother, and many years had passed. He didn't have to do so. But the girl was not satisfied with the fact that her father chose only young beauties as his companions. She constantly told him that they were only after his money. To avoid further irritating his daughter, Roque met with Indiana secretly, but after a year of such secret meetings, the lover announced that she was pregnant. She immediately brought him a test and a certificate. The girl had been trying to entice wealthy suitors for quite some time. She knew that they all demanded proof, so she decided to act promptly with Roque. He was already prepared for it. She felt that he was almost ready to make her his woman and wife. Roque did not refuse the child. He believed that the certificate was real, although he didn't understand why she handed it to him. Eventually, the man introduced Indiana to Victoria. It wouldn't be accurate to say that the meeting between the daughter and the lover occurred in a calm and pleasant atmosphere, but Victoria didn't argue with her father. She simply said that it was his decision and that he should have shed weight on his own. Thus, Indiana and Roque moved in together. However, Roque never became a father for the second time. Indiana had a miscarriage after three weeks of their life together. Victoria openly laughed at her, and even more at her father, who believed it all. Nevertheless, she couldn't get rid of her persistent stepmother, who was only five years older than her. Indiana didn't leave the man's house. After two years of living together, Roque proposed. Indiana didn't have to come up with anything new. The man decided to legalize their relationship. They were still living together. Victoria didn't approve of her father's decision, but she couldn't convince him otherwise. They didn't postpone the wedding for long. Indiana tried to speed up the paperwork. Although Indiana attempted to befriend Victoria, the girl remained cold and distant. Victoria did attend the wedding, and she even tried not to show any dissatisfaction to avoid upsetting her father. He was happy, and that was all that mattered to Victoria. Nothing much changed in the first few months after the wedding. Indiana tried to befriend Victoria, but Victoria simply ignored her. You got what you wanted, but I don't have to be friends with you, Victoria told her. I'm not trying to be your friend, but I'd like us to communicate normally. 
After all, we live in the same house, Indiana replied. Victoria abruptly stood up, took her coffee cup, and went to her room. She always did that. Every time she made coffee, she ignored her father's wife. But as soon as Indiana started talking, Victoria left. It felt intentional, as if she was deliberately showing her disdain. Six months had passed since the wedding. Victoria still hadn't accepted her stepmother, but Indiana wasn't overly concerned. She simply stopped trying to get close to her. She lived for her own pleasure, shopped, visited beauty salons, and spent time with friends. Indiana, you can congratulate me, Juliana said in their latest meeting. I'm moving abroad. What do you mean? Indiana exclaimed. What about your Horacio? He was always a patriot. That's exactly it, the contented friend replied. He had a heart attack. Horacio won't dictate anymore what I should do. I'm the sole heir to his estate. Capable people are managing the business, and I'll just count the profits somewhere on the French Riviera. Indiana even applauded her friend. That's how it is, Juliana, a simple girl from a provincial town, becomes a billionaire. And you didn't even have to put in much effort. Victoria, with her student friends, participated in a project competition. Their idea seemed the most interesting to the jury. They proposed creating a student television network to cover events at the university. Of course, the students wanted to celebrate this achievement, although many believed that Victoria's group won largely thanks to her father. The girl returned home late at night in high spirits, but the next morning her condition was the opposite. Strangely, on the following day, she didn't feel any better. Victoria could only lie down, she had nausea and dizziness. Her whole body ached, and on the third day, it turned out she had a fever. Can a hangover be like this? Roque asked Indiana. The man was worried for his daughter, Victoria had never been seriously ill before. Of course not, his wife replied. I think it's alcohol poisoning. I've heard many stories of how low-quality alcohol literally killed people. Roque pondered. It didn't seem like fiction to him. He was aware of such stories, and similar incidents had occurred among people in his circle. What puzzled Roque was that none of Victoria's friends were affected. Moreover, his daughter had never gotten so intoxicated before. Indiana said she knew an excellent clinic. Even if it turned out to be alcohol poisoning, all treatment would be confidential, and no one would find out. I won't send my daughter to a clinic for alcoholics, Roque bluntly responded. It's just a regular elite clinic, Indiana explained. They'll conduct an examination, and in the event of anything, they'll keep it quiet. Roque said he would think about it. Before bedtime, he checked on his daughter. She looked even worse, her skin had paled further, dark circles formed under her eyes, and her cheeks were sunken. Victoria had visibly lost weight in three days. She ate almost nothing and mostly slept, but only after a huge dose of painkillers. Roque decided that he needed to take his daughter to the hospital. He asked Indiana to arrange things with the doctor, and she promised to help. Victoria didn't resist. She responded to the suggestion of going to the clinic with a silent nod. Of course, she understood that she couldn't recover without medical help. Roque was on edge the whole day. He was afraid to hear a grim diagnosis. Although he held on to the hope that it might just be a simple case of poisoning with straightforward treatment, it never left him. Unfortunately, the doctor had no good news to tell the worried father. You waited too long, Emilio, the chief doctor of the clinic, said he personally took charge of treating such an important patient. Roque helplessly lowered his head. This was exactly what he was afraid to hear, that it was too late and that there was no way to help his daughter. Victoria wasn't just his beloved daughter, she was the only family he had. With a heavy heart, Roque was listening to the doctor's words. His mind refused to accept this information. Emilio explained that Victoria's body had undergone severe intoxication. If she had sought help earlier, they could have saved her, but now the immune system simply couldn't cope with such poisoning. Victoria's organs were already starting to fail. 
In such an advanced stage, Emilio claimed that there was nothing they could do to help. Of course, the doctors will do everything they can, but it's better to prepare for the worst. These words knocked Roque out of reality. He saw and heard nothing around him. The man stumbled out of the doctor's office. Almost without realizing it, he reached his daughter's room and kneeled beside her bed. Roque took Victoria's hand in his and pressed it to his face. I'm sorry, he whispered almost inaudibly. But this time, I am powerless. I can't help you, but I don't want to let you go. My dear daughter, don't give up because I'm already close to giving up. But Victoria didn't respond. She spent most of the time sleeping, occasionally losing consciousness. Two days passed. These were the most terrifying days in Roque's life. He could literally think of nothing else but Victoria's condition. Every call and message made him worry. But one day, the dreaded call finally came. Emilio invited Roque for a conversation. From his tone, the man guessed that it was far from pleasant news. The doctor talked at length about the results of the latest tests, stating that Victoria was barely conscious and describing the excruciating pain she experienced every day. In his own words, Emilio led Roque to a terrifying conclusion. The doctor had only one recommendation. Right now, your daughter can exist only because of the machines that sustain her life, the doctor said. I deliberately chose the word existence because it can't be called life. Emilio, it seems I understand what you want to say, but I won't take such a step, Roque replied. We're just postponing the inevitable, Emilio concluded. We can't save your daughter. I'm sorry. All we can do is ease her suffering. Think about it, but as a doctor, I'm telling you, there's no chance. Roque left the office as a completely different person. He was prepared for the worst, but he never expected something like this. It turned out he had to sign his beloved daughter's death sentence to disconnect her from the machines. He couldn't bring himself to talk to Victoria. The girl was deeply asleep. Most likely, she was unconscious because Victoria didn't even react to touches. It was painful to look at her, but the father still couldn't let her go. He still believed that his daughter would recover. How is Victoria doing? Indiana cautiously asked Roque in the evening. The man struggled to hold back tears. He explained that the only way to help her was to let her go. Roque shared with his wife his feelings about this. He hoped to hear advice from his wife. It's just a nightmare, but maybe it really would be better. She said, Although I, of course, couldn't disconnect my own loved one. But, on the other hand, seeing her suffer is even worse. I gave myself three days to think about this decision, Roque replied. Honestly, I'm starting to doubt Emilio's competence. After all, we're talking about my daughter's life. What do you mean? Indiana asked somewhat fearfully. Are you going to transfer Victoria to another clinic? No, of course not, Roque replied. In her condition, moving is out of the question. I just showed her test results and some medical history to other specialists. Indiana noticeably became nervous. Perhaps she was worried about Victoria. Despite their relationship, they were not strangers to each other. In short, all the doctors told me the same thing as Emilio, Roque sadly concluded. There's no chance, and she's suffering. I'll probably agree. I want my daughter to be free. No pain will torment her for another second. Indiana embraced Roque. She pressed her whole body against him. The man trembled. He cried out of helplessness and out of pity. Even money doesn't solve everything in this world. Roque was ready to give away all his wealth and all his savings just for Victoria to recover, but unfortunately, fate had other plans. The father called Emilio and said he would come in the morning to sign the documents. The doctor sympathized with the unfortunate man, but said it was the only right decision. Through suffocating mental pain, against the pleas of Roque's heart, he signed the papers. Emilio hugged the crying father, saying he was doing a good deed. Victoria is only suffering. She even asked to end this torment herself. Roque had managed to talk to his daughter. 
Victoria really didn't want to drag out such a pathetic existence, but Roque asked to give him time to say goodbye to his daughter, just a few hours. Of course, Emilio didn't object. He said everything would happen only when the man was ready. When Roque approached his daughter's room, he couldn't open the door. The man froze, holding onto the handle. He was wondering how to look into his daughter's eyes now and what to say. Although Victoria asked for release, Roque's conscience still wouldn't be silent. Claudia saw him. She was the cleaning lady's grandmother, a very kind woman. All the patients and staff at the clinic loved her. She was a real guardian of wisdom, and even doctors and millionaire clients liked to consult with her on life matters. Is your Victoria really bad? Claudia asked Roque, who was standing motionless by the door. They will disconnect her from the machines today. I need to say something to her as a farewell, but I don't know what words to choose. What do people think about before they die? The man indeed looked puzzled. He looked at the old woman as his last hope, as if she had to reveal some secret to him. Claudia pondered. She was always ready to help with advice, but this situation was atypical. There was no universal answer. I remember when my mom was leaving, she regretted that she hadn't seen the world, Claudia began to speak. She spent her whole life in the village, saw nothing but her native country, and was glad that around her were loved ones and familiar walls. Your daughter is young. How many impressions has she had in her life? Victoria has traveled a lot, but there's one place I haven't had a chance to take her to, Roque said sadly. The man's parents, despite being well off, were not born in the capital. Roque's mother came from a remote village. When little Roque turned seven, he met his grandmother for the first time. He remembered for life the beautiful nature, forests, and lakes. Later, he returned there more than once, but only during difficult periods of his life. When Roque felt really bad, he would pack a small backpack and head to his grandmother's house. There, in silence, he could reassess his actions and find unexpected solutions to problems. The last time Roque went on such a pilgrimage was when his first wife, Victoria's mother, passed away. Do you want your daughter to leave in a stuffy room within four walls or in the midst of quiet nature? Claudia asked. Modern youth already live in these concrete jumbles, and they don't even hear about the village. You know, I agree with you, Roque said unexpectedly. He even brightened up a bit. I would also prefer to go in the arms of a loved one to some quiet and secluded place. Claudia smiled, but her eyes remained sad. Roque even hugged the old woman and thanked her. The man felt a little calmer. He called his assistant and told him to come and buy tickets as quickly as possible. Roque decisively entered the room, removed all the sensors from Victoria's body, and took the girl in his arms. What are you doing, Dad? Victoria asked faintly. She had almost no strength. She couldn't even move her hand. We're heading home. And if you are about to leave, let it happen there, Roque said, even with some optimistic notes in his voice. Assistant Jorge was already waiting for his boss at the clinic gate. When he saw Roque with the girl in his arms, he immediately got out of the car and opened the door. The man sat with his daughter in the back seat. Victoria lay on his lap. She didn't even have the strength to sit. What about the tickets? Roque asked Jorge. The nearest flight is only on the weekend, but judging by your tone, I understood that you urgently need it. So, I found a private helicopter for you. One of your acquaintances agreed to lend you his for the flight. It's Malibio, and I've already settled with him. Jorge, I don't pay you in vain, Roque said. He was pleased with the young man's work. Then, let's go straight there without stopping at home. Within a few hours, Roque was carrying his daughter out of the plane. Now they had a journey to the village ahead. The man's heart was pounding. He hadn't been at these heights for so long. Even the air here was different. He managed to tell Indiana that he had left for an indefinite period and that he wanted to say goodbye to his daughter like a human being. The girl was extremely unhappy with such a move from her beloved. Have you gone crazy? Indiana said. Transporting Victoria somewhere in this condition is just a reckless act. 
If she's destined to die anyway, let it happen here, Roque replied. At least she'll see nature one last time and not spend her final moments staring at a white ceiling and a bright lamp. The grandmother's house had tilted a bit over time, but it added a unique authenticity and an atmospheric touch. Inside, everything remained just as it was during Aurelia's grandmother's time. Neither he nor his mother intentionally changed anything, wanting to step into their childhood when they visited. The grandmother used to keep cows and chickens. Milk jugs were still standing on the shelves. Being here, Roque felt like a seven-year-old boy again, just starting his life's journey. It was warm and cozy in his heart, yet also melancholic. Nostalgia for his grandparents and parents gripped him. Now, this place would be associated with where his daughter took her last breath. His mother started the tradition of coming to this place during difficult life moments. She, too, returned to her homeland only during the most dreadful emotional states, her husband's death, business problems, and her son's wedding. Yes, it was a traumatic event for her as well. She didn't want to let her little boy go. Roque, however, didn't only live through tough periods here. He would just visit when facing difficult decisions. Before proposing to his first wife, he was here, and then after her death. For some reason, he felt that this house and these pine trees held numerous memories. The energy there was incredible. Looking at the trees, he forgot about everything. He missed this feeling in the city. How good it was that Claudia reminded him of it. This little house had amazing healing power. When he looked at the forest and the lakes, all the problems immediately seemed small and insignificant in the grand scheme of the world. Now Roque was sitting on the porch, gazing at the sky. Years passed, there was no grandmother or mother anymore, but these pine trees were still there, the water in the lakes remained crystal clear, and the sky was just as blue. Only people changed, and the landscape remained the same. Victoria couldn't yet appreciate the beauty of nature and savor the atmosphere. The journey had exhausted her. She already had limited life resources. Roque laid his daughter on a down blanket and took care of preparing dinner. He knew that in the village, you could find anything if you knew where to look. The man went to his neighbors to get meat and vegetables. The village was remote, almost forgotten by people. Some indigenous residents still stayed here. Not everyone sought the city. The youth, of course, left, leaving parental homes, but the elderly held onto their roots until the end. The grandmother's house was closest to the forest. It took about five minutes, not in a hurry, to reach the first neighboring house. Roque was fortunate. He immediately saw someone in the yard of the first house. It was a young man, which surprised Roque. He didn't expect to encounter his daughter's peer in the village. The young man introduced himself as Zenobio, explaining that he had lived here since birth. His parents passed away, and he got the house. To move to the city, he needed money he didn't have, and no one wanted to buy a house in a remote village. So he lived here, the only representative of the youth. But I'm not complaining, Zenobio said. Everything suits me. I help the local veterinarian. He's getting really old. I plan to replace him in the future. Here, there's nature and food. I like it. I have a feeling that there won't be anyone to treat you here in a few years. The last old people will live out their days and all the livestock will be gone, Roque replied. You're right, Zenobio said sadly. There are only about 20 old people left here. In 15 years, I think I'll be the only one left, going completely wild. Well, you can't live like this, Roque said. Come on, gather your strength, save some money, and go to the city. There's no reason for someone like you to waste your time in the wilderness. Roque liked this guy. It was evident that he was a kind and compassionate person. Zenobio gave Roque a bucket of potatoes and a chicken carcass, which he had slaughtered for himself in the morning, and he didn't mind at all. He even refused payment, explaining that he lived alone and had a bountiful harvest. Onions and carrots wouldn't surprise anyone in the village. Everyone had gardens. Still, Roque gave him money. Maybe you can help me figure all this out? Roque asked, examining the groceries. 
Honestly, I can't remember the last time I peeled potatoes, let alone prepared a chicken. Zenobio sighed and chuckled. Compared to this young man, the grown-up Roque looked like a helpless child, and his gaze was accordingly a bit frightened. When he left the city, inspired by the idea of solitude in nature, he didn't think about having to cook, do laundry, and do the rest by himself. Zenobio couldn't refuse to help. He was happy to meet someone other than his neighbors. In his quiet and monotonous life, this interaction became a whole adventure. On the way to Roque's house, he told the young man about the reason for his visit. Zenobio was listening with sympathy and concern. It was evident that his emotions were genuine. I believe you did the right thing, he said when he finished listening. Zenobio froze in the doorway when he saw Victoria. He felt unbearably sorry for this girl. She was so beautiful and young that even illness couldn't hide the delicate and graceful features of her face. What is it like to know that you're living your last days when there could have been so much more ahead, he thought. Victoria nodded to the young man, indicating that she was pleased to meet him. She couldn't speak. Two hours later, the little house was filled with an appetizing aroma. Zenobio was cooking soup in the oven. Even Victoria lifted her head a bit to see what smelled so good. Whether you like it or not, you'll have to try, Zenobio said with a kind smile to Victoria. If only a little. I'm afraid I won't be able to handle more than a couple of spoons, Victoria replied. Roque praised the dish so much, saying he hadn't tasted anything better in any restaurant worldwide. This is what real, natural food means, Roque pronounced pompously. With this kind of service, you might just make a full recovery. Of course, Roque was joking. He was trying to cheer up his daughter in any way he could, but everyone understood that neither the world's tastiest soup nor the freshest air would help avoid what destiny had in store. Although Victoria seemed a bit brighter, she even found some strength to talk to Zenobio. In the evening, she asked me to take her outside. She wanted to gaze at the starry sky. In the metropolis, you couldn't see stars, the lighting there was very bright. Here, only one lantern lit up the entire village. Roque carried his daughter outside, and Zenobio quickly placed a chair for her to sit in. Victoria raised her head and was amazed. Thousands, even millions, of bright lights covered the entire sky. She had never seen anything like it. Roque, too, enjoyed this magical sight. He had forgotten when he last saw a real starry night. Now, I'm not afraid to die, Victoria said. I'll be up there, running among these lights. Roque couldn't hold back tears when he heard those words. They brought him back to reality. This day in the village was unlike any other in his life. He felt alive, taking care of his daughter and trying to give her some experiences within his means. In that moment, she was happy, and she spoke so casually about death, which was already creeping up on her. No, he couldn't bear this. No matter how hard he tried to deceive himself, accepting this fact was impossible. Especially by evening, as Victoria began to feel a bit better. She hadn't lost consciousness once all day, she just napped a little. Look, a shooting star. Zenobio shouted. Make a wish quickly. It was unknown what the young man asked from the sky or what Victoria was thinking when she closed her eyes and smiled, but Roque had only one wish, impossible, of course, but he still asked for his daughter to live because hope dies last. The next day, Victoria looked a bit better than all the previous days. Her eyes weren't as dull anymore. She even managed to sit up a bit on the bed, not just lie motionless. The girl asked for a hot cup of coffee. This both delighted and surprised her father. Before, she had no interest in food whatsoever. He prepared for her the best coffee of her life, made with real herbs. Zenobio dropped by for a visit. He also happily noticed that Victoria looked better. Maybe she'll recover? He suggested. We have such nature here. Old people live till they turn 100 years old. Roque smiled but there was sadness in his eyes. He didn't want to deceive himself. If the doctor said there was no chance, then there was none. He had heard that sometimes, before death,
people experienced a second wind and grasped at their last days. However, no matter how much he wished, nothing could save Victoria. Indiana went crazy in the city. Roki turned off his phone, and she couldn't even find out how things were with their daughter. She was ready to go find them, but Roki didn't say where they went. He only mentioned that they were in some village, but there were so many of them. It's been a week since the man abducted his daughter from the hospital, but there was no news. Finally, Roke called his wife himself. His voice trembled, and it was hard for him to speak. At first, he remained silent for a long time, just breathing into the receiver. Victoria is not here anymore, Roke uttered. I'll come tomorrow, on the same day, we'll have the funeral. I've already arranged everything. Indiana immediately began expressing condolences, trying to find words to support her husband, but he didn't need it. Roque didn't listen to her, he simply hung up. You pity her, don't lie. Roque exclaimed contemptuously, looking at the phone. Well, did she not shout hooray? Victoria asked with a laugh. She was actually alive. After the conversation with Indiana, Roque called his security chief, who was monitoring the house. He asked to find out what the girl would do when she heard the news of her stepdaughter's death. The man told him that she had just left somewhere, but her mood was cheerful, nothing like grief. Please, keep an eye on where she went. If she meets someone, let me know, Roque requested. The thing was, after the girl arrived in the village, or more precisely, left the hospital, miraculously all her pain disappeared. Victoria's condition improved with each passing day. After a week, she could already get out of bed and help her father with household chores. She still experienced dizziness and nausea occasionally, and her muscles ached, but all of this was incomparable to how her condition deteriorated in the clinic. Of course, Roque couldn't help but notice this magical healing. Even Zenobio said that Victoria looked nothing like a dying girl. The pieces of the puzzle started to come together for Roque. Indiana advised him to go to a specific clinic. It was advantageous for his wife to get rid of the soul heir. To finally make sure that they did something to his daughter, Roque found a doctor in the nearby city. The city was a district center, so finding a private clinic there was not a problem. Roque left Zenobio to watch over his daughter and went to the doctor himself. He had to pay a decent sum to the doctor for him to agree to come to the village and take Victoria's blood for analysis. The next day, the doctor came to Roque's house and reported that there was a poisonous substance in the girl's blood, unrelated to alcohol. It was a common poison that had gradually accumulated in her body. Now it had stopped entering her bloodstream, so Victoria's condition had improved. The doctor set up a drip to cleanse her blood and left. Dad, your beloved did this, Victoria said. I'm telling you for sure. She came to me that day when I returned from the party, gave me some drinks, and said it would help me in the morning. But why didn't you tell me about this earlier? Roque wondered. Victoria replied that she simply couldn't have thought that someone would decide to poison her, so she didn't pay much attention to the incident. But now there was no doubt that she had received her first dose of poison at that very moment. The security guard reported on Indiana's movements around the city. First, she visited the clinic where Victoria was treated, then met with a friend. Judging by her mood and behavior, it seemed like she was celebrating something. The news of Victoria's death did not fit into this scenario at all. Is it true? The guard asked. Is Victoria dead? No, but it's a secret, Roque replied. Don't tell anyone. Now you must continue monitoring her or assign someone to do so, but make sure she doesn't notice. If anything strange happens, inform me immediately. Roque didn't lie to Indiana about his daughter's death for no reason. He wanted to see what she would do next. However, he had to stage a whole performance for her. The man actually organized a funeral for his daughter. Victoria suggested this idea herself. Initially resistant, Roque claimed that they should keep it within a close circle. They invited only a couple of their closest friends, but told them in advance that the girl was alive and it was all just a setup for one person. 
Victoria was lying in the coffin. They lowered it into the ground, but didn't bury. At that moment, Roque said he didn't want to witness it and led his wife away. It was then that Victoria emerged from the grave and left with Zenobio to the apartment Roque had rented for them. The girl later had to explain to her friends the purpose of this performance. She asked everyone not to reveal the secret about Victoria before the right time came. Seeing your own flesh and blood in the coffin must be very painful, Indiana remarked. The woman was playing her role perfectly. She cried, spoke words of support, and even delivered a poignant farewell speech at the cemetery. Victoria barely restrained herself from getting up and swapping places with this hypocrite. Roque couldn't bear to listen to her words either. How well Indiana knew how to lie. It took him so long to recognize the cunning fraudster. If Roque had any doubts about his revenge plan before, now he was sure that he wouldn't back down. He needed to teach Indiana a lesson. The young man went with them to the city. Victoria persuaded him. The girl enjoyed talking to the simple village guy. He was different from any of her acquaintances and friends. The young man knew many fascinating stories that his mom and grandma had told him. But most of all, his humanity attracted the girl. They had to persuade Zenobio. He didn't want to leave his homeland, but Roque said that the young man could always return to the village if he didn't like city life. The final argument was that Roque promised to enroll Zenobio at the university so that he could pursue his dream of becoming a veterinarian. Thus, the staged farewell ceremony came to an end. Roque played the role of a grieving father excellently, but he focused on Indiana's behavior. He needed to find out what action the woman would take next. The head of security assigned surveillance to her, and Roque managed to wiretap her phone. Indiana had no intention of wasting time. She began implementing the next part of her plan the very next day. But first, she met Emilio and handed him the second part of the payment for Victoria's murder. How scared I was when he took our daughter from the hospital, Indiana told the doctor. I thought they would catch us. To be honest, I was overwhelmed by terrible fears too, Emilio said. I would have suffered much more than you if our actions had been exposed. Well, it seems Victoria had a very weak immune system if that dosage was enough. After listening to this dialogue, Roque suspected that his wife had bribed the clinic and the doctor. But he had already thought about it before. Indiana simply couldn't carry out all this alone. He chose not to delete the recording. It will be useful for the investigation after I administer justice myself, Roque said with a cold cruelty in his voice. Regarding the doctors, there was only one decision for him. They would sit in jail. But Roque wanted to play with Indiana. She wouldn't get away with a simple prison sentence. For her, Roque devised a plan of revenge. This revelation came after he learned that she wanted to poison him next. Yes, Indiana wanted to get rid of the heiress. That was the reason why she poisoned Victoria. After that, she was planning to deal with Roque to acquire all his property. That was the girl's rather straightforward plan for enrichment. Indiana also intended to poison her husband. He even understood the moment when she began doing it. When he found out that he was a potential victim of a cunning fraudster, he placed cameras around the house. Every time Indiana went somewhere, he observed her actions on his phone. That's how he noticed her dropping something into his coffee cup and then kindly serving it to him for breakfast. Roque naturally didn't drink it, he just pretended. As Indiana left, he poured everything down the sink. All right, you want a show? You'll get it, Roque hissed through his teeth, watching Indiana drive away on some errands. She was heading to meet a friend who hadn't left the country yet. There were still some things to do. Surprisingly, Juliana praised her friend for her actions, saying she would never have thought of such a thing herself. If I were as smart as you, I would have done the same a long time ago, Juliana said but I was lucky that Horacio turned out to be weak-hearted. Roque heard this conversation too. He was indirectly familiar with Horacio. He couldn't say anything bad about him. It amazed him how these young girls loved money. Not every man would dare to commit such terrible deeds. Despite their love for a luxurious life, these friends didn't want to work hard. 
they expected money to fall into their laps. Among his acquaintances, Roque hadn't noticed such thinking. The next morning, Indiana did the same. Roque was still in bed. Apparently, she wanted to bring him breakfast in bed. When she entered, he pretended to feel very unwell, complaining of a headache. It's not surprising, you went through such stress, Indiana smiled at him. Here, drink some coffee, you'll feel better. It always helps me. As you wish, my love. But I want to be alone for a while, Roque replied. He did it too convincingly. It seemed like he overdid the acting, but the girl didn't notice anything. Indiana was so obsessed with her idea that she didn't pay attention to obvious things. She never noticed that Roque didn't eat or drink what she brought him, or that he pretended to be a sufferer only when she was looking at him. Indiana was so engrossed in her idea that she didn't want to see anything else. She just continued her dirty work and imagined how she would spend the first million. Roque started his game. Indiana continued to poison him, adding poison to his food or drinks. The man didn't eat anything she cooked. He claimed to feel worse and worse. His wife suggested that he go to the same clinic where his daughter had been. Her naivety surprised Roque. Couldn't they come up with something new? It was just not interesting. Do you think they can help me if they didn't save Victoria? Roque skeptically asked. With Victoria, we simply took too long. You can't risk it, Indiana persuaded him. The sooner you see a doctor, the better your chances of surviving. Roque was amazed that Indiana really thought he was such a fool, but he willingly played along. He wanted to finish this business as quickly as possible. It was time for the next step. You're right, we shouldn't delay, he said. But I won't die in a hospital bed. Let the doctor come to me. Besides, I have another matter to attend to. At that moment, Roque called his assistant, Jorge, and asked if the notary had arrived. The guy replied that he had been waiting in the living room for a long time. Why do you need a notary? Indiana asked. Her eyes sparkled. Clearly, the conversation was about the will. She knew that there was no one but her in Roque's life. I want to formalize my inheritance. More precisely, it's already prepared. We just need to verify something and sign, Roque replied. Indiana asked to stay, if possible. She had no idea that this was even necessary. Roque wanted to see her face when she heard who he had made the heir to his wealth. The notary entered. He was a very serious young man. He greeted everyone, sat next to the patient's bed, and began reading the text of the will. With each word spoken by the notary, Indiana's face contorted more and more. It expressed not just surprise, but shock and aggression. Who is Zenobio Pena? Indiana asked slowly when he finished reading the text. Who is he? This man once saved my life, Roque replied. I choked on a bone in a restaurant, and he was the only one who knew what to do. I promised back then that I would fully repay him. If things get worse for me, I must complete this task. He will be my successor. Roque spoke in an extremely serious tone, although it was difficult for him not to smile while watching his wife's emotions. The excessive seriousness of the notary, who was just an ordinary actor, added a touch of grandeur to the whole situation. Indiana was simply lost. She wanted to have a tantrum and make a scene, but that would expose her guilt, so she restrained herself. So, you're leaving me with nothing, and Zenobio will live in our house, managing your business? What about me? Indiana asked, struggling to keep herself composed. You can stay with him, Roque replied carelessly. Zenobio is a great guy. He's a little younger than you. You two will get along. Indiana got angry and left the room. Roque immediately burst into laughter, and the notary supported him. He didn't know all the nuances, but he roughly understood the purpose of this prank. And now, my dear... The most interesting part begins, Roque said with an unusual cruelty in his voice. It was unclear what Indiana was planning to do next. She continued to add poison to Roque, just as before. Emilio, 
contrary to Roque's expectations, did come to conduct an examination, although Roque thought a smarter doctor would be more appropriate. At first, Emilio was visibly nervous, but then he pulled himself together. I need to take some blood for analysis, he said. You won't, Roque replied. I won't allow you to examine me. You didn't save my little girl, so I don't trust you. I agreed to your visit only for the sake of my wife. If you tell me that maintaining my life is pointless, I will agree with you and sign any document. Just leave me alone. Emilio obediently left the room. Roque immediately turned on his phone to listen to what the doctor would talk about with his wife. Emilio said that this time everything would be even easier than before. According to him, Roque was in an extremely depressed state due to the loss of his daughter, so he wouldn't understand or notice anything. Indiana rejoiced. Only one problem remained, the unexpected heir. Try to find out who he is and where he lives, Emilio ordered. If needed, we can deal with him too. I have enough substances for everyone. I will find him, Indiana replied. You can be sure of that. No one will take my money away. Roque laughed at his wife's words. How quickly she considered his fortune hers. Indiana's determination, combined with his audacity, amazed him. Nothing would stop this lady in pursuit of her goal. She should have started a business instead of maiming people. Well, Roque had prepared something for her, a payback worthy of a person like Indiana. Since he pretended to be sick, Indiana began sleeping in a separate room. She went to bed quite early, and one day she woke up to a strange sound right next to her ear. She opened her eyes, and a piercing scream echoed throughout the house. Yet, no one paid attention because everyone already knew what had happened. Indiana opened her eyes, and Victoria was standing right in front of her. The girl was convinced that her husband's daughter was dead. She personally saw her in the coffin. Victoria deliberately applied scary makeup to look terrifying, dressed in all white, which was invisible in the darkness but created the desired effect. Go away, go away. Indiana kept repeating. She crossed herself several times and tried to remember any prayer, but nothing came to her mind. Victoria slowly approached Indiana and leaned over her. What? Was it all in vain? Victoria whispered in a creepy voice. Why did you bury me alive? Indiana turned pale with fear. She was on the verge of losing consciousness. Victoria slowly lifted her head and then began to move backward towards the door. She didn't turn her back. She simply retreated, never taking her eyes off Indiana. As soon as Victoria closed the door, Indiana jumped off the bed and swung open the door, but there was no one behind it. Victoria had managed to quickly escape around the corner and hide. She had to cover her mouth to stifle her laughter. The next morning, Indiana looked terrible. Roque asked what happened, but she remained silent. Now, every night, Victoria would visit her stepmother, and every morning Roque struggled to suppress a smile, observing Indiana going mad. Maybe we should see a psychiatrist? Roque suggested. Hallucinations are not a joke. I'll take you to a private clinic, and no one will know. Indiana was so frightened that she didn't even notice Roque using the same words she said when persuading him to send Victoria to the hospital. She silently nodded because she had indeed become afraid for her own well-being. Of course, Thai bribed everyone at the hospital. Unlike Indiana, Roque had no intention of killing her. The doctor began the examination, and at that moment, Victoria entered the room and sat next to Indiana. A small chair, conveniently placed by the fake psychiatrist, was waiting for her. She's here. Indiana screamed. There. Can't you see her? Roque and the doctor exchanged glances and shrugged. Both shook their heads. Indiana was in hysterics, claiming that the deceased girl was sitting next to her. She was screaming and crying. The doctor recommended that Indiana stay in the hospital for a few days, and she immediately agreed. For some reason, she thought that the ghost wouldn't enter her hospital room. The attendants escorted her. As soon as she left, loud laughter echoed from the doctor's office. 
We don't wish her any harm, just a little scare, Victoria said. Don't worry, the doctor replied. We'll give her injections full of vitamins, and then we'll let her go. You won't come to her at night anymore, will you? Victoria had no intention of continuing her haunting activities. With Indiana safely confined to the psychiatric hospital, Roque could now proceed to file charges, initiate divorce proceedings, and deal with everyone involved in poisoning his daughter. Victoria returned home, inventing Zenobio to live with them. Zenobio began preparing for his university exams and genuinely enjoyed life in the city. Indiana spent a week in the hospital, and then the time for her discharge had come. Roque had prepared all the divorce documents and was ready for a serious conversation. However, the doctor met him in the lobby and invited him into his office. I have some not so good news, depending on how you look at it, the doctor said. Your daughter didn't come to the hospital, did she? Roque shook his head negatively. Indiana was no longer troubling Victoria. They had achieved what they wanted. The original plan was to put Indiana in prison, but the doctor explained that Indiana continued to see Victoria. She constantly begged for forgiveness, but her stepdaughter insisted. You did it all for nothing. This information terrified Roque. They didn't intend to drive Indiana insane. It was supposed to be a lesson for her. It seems we are no better than her, Roque said. The doctor disagreed, saying that, after analyzing Indiana's stories and visions, he concluded that she didn't regret her actions. What drove her crazy was not the fact that she had killed a young girl, but that she wouldn't inherit anything. Indiana confessed that she had planned to poison Roque next and settle scores with the unknown Zenobio. Therefore, the doctor decided to temporarily keep Indiana in their care and later transfer her to a state hospital if Roque didn't intend to pay for her upkeep. Naturally, Roque had no plans to treat the failed murderer. Indiana spent another week in the private clinic before transferring to another hospital. As far as Roque knew, she never managed to overcome her obsession, constantly muttering, it was all for nothing. She didn't see any ghosts anymore, but this phrase had firmly entrenched itself in her mind. I think she deserves it, Zenobio said, now living in Roque's house. Just like the doctor. Emilio was arrested during his regular workday, right in front of the entire clinic. He had no idea that the police planned to arrest him long time ago. He continued working calmly, planning to go on vacation soon and looking for a new apartment, while the investigator kept gathering evidence. Besides the recorded conversation, he obtained bank statements showing significant transfers from Indiana. The corrupt doctor had no chance of escaping justice. Roque didn't forget about Claudia, the one who initially uncovered the whole scheme. Claudia received a well-deserved reward, even though she didn't understand it at first. Roque explained that he followed her advice and that it helped Victoria to heal. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.